Yeah, it's so great to talk with you guys today. I am a geek at heart. It's probably obvious by maybe some things you can spot in my <laughs> yep. office. You can't really uh-huh. see too much, and I see your guys' background too. Yes. I'm curious, you know, with Prodigy, it's so exciting because it's like the first um, show targeted at the younger audience, but even just for like first time Star Trek fans, which is really cool, you know, it definitely doesn't feel like a kid's show. I'm curious, like when you guys were writing, sitting down, looking at the show, was this your approach for it all along to be like an introduction to Star Trek at large, no matter the age, or how did that really come about? I have to laugh, like whenever there was those early announcements of our show, and it's gonna be a Nickelodeon Star Trek show for kids, and all the fans were like, okay, and I'm like, oh, you just wait, you just wait. Because always from day one, this is a show for everyone. You know, that's how we write. And and good stories for us, like we grew up on E.T. and mm-hmm. Goonies and all these wonderful Amblin, Spielberg, you know, movies. And those are movies for the whole family. And they're funny and they're magical and they're heartwarming and they're frightening. And, you know, and that's, we really want to embody, we wanted to embody that spirit. That's great. Yeah. And I think what I love too about the show is, you know, they're not really Starfleet at the beginning. They're not really Starfleet members or trainees. And so they kind of fall into this uh, experience training with a hologram with Captain Janeway. You know, I imagine you guys in the writer room kind of like with like strings and post-its being like, okay, we need to incorporate Kobayashi Maru. We need to incorporate, uh, you know, this part of Starfleet. Like, how did that come about? And how expansive is your knowledge of Star Trek that you guys are all able to do that? Well, I think early on, we, we always do a blue sky thing where we're like, well, what, what would be a great episode? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea that Kobayashi Maru episode came up. Um, That's episode- just great, but what's the greatest hit? Like, I was very, like, the- introducing... Mm-hmm whether it's kids or adults who have never seen Star Trek before, how yes. do you do that? What are the quick, like we just had a holodeck gone oh, awry right. episode air uh, last night. And I'm like, that's classic, right? That is in any Trek series. Sorry, Dan, I didn't mean that. But yeah, but it's like we, we, we our makeup of our writer's room is there's, there's some people who have never seen any Star Trek. There's some people who have seen all of Star Trek. Um, we kind of, I feel like we kind of float in the middle a bit where we grew up with a lot of the films. Um, we were a little too young for the original series, um, a little too old for TNG. I don't even know. Maybe we're about to say I was just in college during TV. I was in college, so I wasn't watching TV. When- <clears throat> yeah, I was studying, but uh, but I, but we were very familiar with it. So um, we understood the DNA. We understood like what makes Star Trek great, and it was fun to kind of pull those things out and put them into a show for not just people who have seen Star Trek, but people who have never seen Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and it's a great introduction, I think, for those things. So you don't have to feel walking in that you already needed to know about all of these terms and the, the legacy items for the show. So that's that's um, Alex Kurtzman's, you know, brilliant idea. You know, he realized, you know, there's so many shows now coming out, and it's kind of intimidating. Where do you start? How do you get into this? How do I, you know? Yes. And so that's why we really wanted to take the time. Like there's an episode where you introduce, you know, a transporter for the first time, and we make sure that people kind of understand what that is, and then we get to use it, you know? Yeah, it's 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 a bit intimidating because I think the the fans of Star Trek know Star Trek so well. Oh, yes. So there's people <laughs> who are curious about Star Trek, but they're like, I don't want to walk into a room and be bombarded by like being the dumbest person in the room. So. Um, I think what I love about this, there's a lot of there's a lot of Trek fans whose spouses are watching the show and like they're excited mm-hmm. that their spouses are now like, I know I understand Star Trek now, you know, so that's that's a big win for our books. I feel like Star Trek fans, too, always are, you know, touting that it's anchored in science, too, you know, versus maybe more of a fantasy angle. So I know for this show, too, STEM was really important um, with the younger audience coming on board. And I think I read there may have been. Um, some advisors, some science advisors kind of help with that. Like, how did you kind of incorporate STEM, you know, knowing with this younger audience watching, how does it kind of surface in the show? Well, let me, let, let's go through a few, uh, our handful of advisors that you need when you create a Star Trek show. Like we had David Mack, who mm-hmm. is a prolific uh, Star Trek writer, uh, so many novels and things. And he really helped us, you know, uh, you know, like, like 
like rock what, talk. He's like, there's a, there, we're like, we need like a rock creature. And he's like, well, there's this creature uh, called Rakar. And we're like, interesting, you know? And we were like, we needed something. Um, he would always correct us. Sometimes we'd like have this great story idea, but he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't just do that so quickly. Everyone's going to, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, he and then also, also Dr. Erin McDonald, we worked quite a bit with. And she's, she's our kick-ass astrophysicist. And she came in and it was great. She didn't know what our show was about on the first day. But she had this tattoo of Voyager on her arm. And I'm like, you just wait. I'm like, and so when she found we got out, yeah. Like, yeah. she's like, er, 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 the big question was always like, did you actually get Kate Mulgrew? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we got Kate Mulgrew. But we got, gosh, we had, um, what was he, a geneticist? Dr. Muhammad Noor. Yeah, a geneticist for an episode. I mean, we're constantly, oh, uh, whenever we have Klingon talk, you know, we, we try to use the, at first we were using the online Klingon translators, which He's I'm sorry, there. they're not that accurate. And so we <laughs> have, I can't remember her name, but we brought her in and she is the official Star Trek Klingon translator. So it's it's nuts, like the amount of help you need. It's it's too much if we were- But I think it's important for, I mean, you we look at like, you know, if there was a six-year-old watching this and this is their first Star Trek show, like what, what would we want it to be? What would we want it to convey? Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted it to be science accurate. We felt like yeah. um, this was a show that, you know, people could be watching 20 years from now, just as people are watching TOS, you know, so many years later. And we want to make sure that we get it right. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious if you were a crew member, I, I think I'd probably be, you know, a red shirt who's gone in an episode or two, but what position would you be on the ship? Well, that's a good, I don't think we ever had that question. I have to say, I, I, I would, I would like to be a number one because, you know, it's all the adventure going down onto the planets <laughs> and stuff. You're kind of in the heat of all the action. I'd probably enjoy that. I'd be a horrible number one. I think I'd probably be like. Um, You'd want to be a captain. I'd probably be like Neelix. I'd be like behind the kitchen doing some mix. <laughs> really? <laughs> what about you, Monica? Well, I would definitely be the expendable crew member. You know, oh, I would be right down on mission. You wouldn't see me in the next episode. I don't think I'd make it very long, but I'd like you to think watch I'd be like engineering 13. or something like that. <laughs> okay. episode, episode 13 is an ode to the red shirt. Oh, okay. I'll have to look for that one. That's great. There's, there's Ensign Garavik, who is on TOS, and it kind of is a continuation of his story. So That's great. Um, I'm curious, too. We talk a lot about Star Trek fans. Um, they're very passionate. They're very knowledgeable. Have you guys ever kind of encountered a hard question from a Star Trek fan that you just were like, I don't know how to answer that? Like, what's the hardest question anyone's ever thrown at you guys as Star Trek experts, you know? Oh my gosh. Well, we shield ourselves with Aaron Walke. And Aaron Walke yeah. is our um our right hand on the series where uh he knows everything about Trek. So yeah, been... sometimes people will, will find a little logic loophole. Oh yeah. But Trek, but Trek like... fans are like are used to like finding some mind-bending ways of saying there there was an episode in um Time Amok where for whatever reason um the wrong star date got through to the to the actual episode and, and we've been reviewing it for so long but none of us really understand star dates and we had it recorded or the right version but it never got into the final thing and so people were like well this doesn't make sense if this episode takes place two years later and <laughs> Rocky goes well because they were by a tachyon storm the uh the computer was off and that was the reason for the wrong star date so yeah that was a little bit of a mind-bending answer to a question that we didn't have the right answer to <laughs> that's great i love well, that you, you, and i was gonna say like now that our episodes are coming out i i'm amazed to see fan <clears throat> freezing uh, uh, still from our show zooming in finding that thing that like oh my god I, I keep getting scared but thank god like we've got amazing prop designers who are doing their due diligence and mm -hmm. they're like oh yeah this is great this is the same thing used in episode 14 of of of, of deep space nine and i'm like Oh, thank God, because yeah. yeah, we can't, we can't do all that. Yeah, because we're working on 20, sometimes 40 episodes simultaneously. And like to be able to have the, the hyper focus to make sure everything is yeah. right. It's we're it's, trying to concentrate most on story and character and making sure it's it, 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 that's working as well. And then we've got Ben Ebon, who, who is our 
uh, supervising director who like Being creative yeah it's beautiful because of him he's like a true artist and he's bringing such an original visual voice to this show i'm so happy that it our show doesn't look like just something right out of the, the pixar you know machine you know it's really something special and daring and different looking that's great well thank you guys so much for talking to me about prodigy i'm excited to see some of the new episodes coming out get caught up and uh live long and prosper Live Thank, long you, and prosper. Monica. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So